talk I gave here was on, on uh, cloud and, and uh, the, uh, some of the issues of keeping, uh, working on cloud infrastructure and things like this. And this is sort of related to that in the sense that there's an emphasis not only on, not only on how things perform, but what, what, what the cost is of using them. And so, and so what you'll see is a, a discussion of, of costs, what you see is a discussion of performance, what you see is a discussion of where they come together and how that impacts how you think about them. So, um, some years ago, a famous computer scientist in the database area uh, uh, made a case for the fact that uh, the traditional database vendors were losing ground to the to the special purpose database vendors. That one size did not fit all, and that traditional traditional database vendors were were, were in fact losing losing their uh, their position in the marketplace. Uh, column stores were eating away at one end, streaming systems were eating away at another end, and main memory systems were at, eating away at the third end of the triangle. So, some respects, the, the traditional database systems. We're, we're losing ground, and the situation was beginning to look like this. Right? And, and the comment there was that, that people thought that one size fit all are soon going to find out that one size fits nothing. Right? And, and Mike knows who this was for sure. I won't mention his name. You know, he's a bit of a sacred character in the database field. You can draw your own conclusions. Um, so, so that looks pretty grim for traditional database systems. And, and so, and so um, you know, um, okay. So, so what's going on with traditional database systems? There you go. I mean, there's the, there's the graveyard, right? You've got all the, the big vendors there. And there's even Amazon Aurora, uh, and they're all they're <laughs> heading for the cemetery, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, what's happening? Well, that's not happening. Um, but the fact of the matter is that nothing of that sort is happening. The fact of the matter is, is that the elephants are still dancing. Uh, uh, they're all in fine shape economically. Uh, they're basically not really worried. I mean, some of them have main memory offerings, but they're not really worried about the, 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 the vendors because the, the big part of the market is still theirs. It's not being, they're not dead. Uh, they're thriving, in fact. The database business is getting better and better. So why? So here's what's happening. There's the traditional database systems. Uh, uh, what's happened with streaming? Well, you know, streaming has not become really a part of a traditional database engine, but they work together now, actually, and, 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 and there's a fair bit of work in terms of using, using streaming systems with database systems to rather good effect, right? And so, so rather than feeding into <coughs> the, the, the traditional database system work, Streaming systems have found a life of their own, and they, they sort of contribute in a general, general sort of uh, technology uh, world. The column store stuff, every single traditional <coughs> database vendor that I'm aware of has put column store functionality into the database. And so it's, so it's not really a case that you have to go to a separate vendor to get, to get the, uh, a column store functionality. It's there. It's an Oracle. It's an IBM. It's a SQL Server. Uh, if it's not in... Uh, on a, on a whole bunch of them, right? Um, and, and, and main memory database systems, well, what's happened there? I'm going to claim that's a niche market. <coughs> that's a market which has some interesting properties to it. There's some big customers there, but there's not many. In fact, I had a conversation with Andy Pablo uh, uh, not too long ago in which I told him that in, in Microsoft, we call the main memory database market a $0 billion business. Microsoft is only interested in multi-billion multi dollar businesses. So having something be a zero billion dollar business is, a, is an indication that you shouldn't pay much attention to it, right? So, so uh, in Microsoft <coughs> world, uh, we, have a, we have a main memory database system. In fact, in fact, my project contributed to it, you know, the BW3, that those of you who know about that sort of stuff. Uh, but it's not a huge market, right? And, and this is more of, an, of, a, of a way to get interesting technology into the rest of SQL Server because the main memory market is only modest in size and not a good fit for this. So why, so, so most, of the, most of the rest of the talk will be on why a 
it's a, it's a niche market. It's a very high performance market. Why isn't it carrying the day? Well, there are economic factors, not just performance factors. There are economic factors as well. So um, you need to pay attention to what the hardware infrastructure costs. Uh, and, you, and, 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 and if you're a cloud provider, you live in the, I want my cloud infrastructure hardware to be a commodity desperately, right? Because that's what, that's what gives you the ability to, to come in at costs lower than a regular customer could, in fact, buy the equipment out. So it has to be absolutely plain vanilla. You might be able to tell it to your own uses, but it has to be hardware that's really uh, generated in very large volume and very low cost. You need, a, you need your software to run on that commodity hardware. And the interesting, one of the interesting things that's happened is uh, that that commodity hardware now includes, it's probably not as new to you, you probably don't remember it, but the commodity hardware used to be hard disks, it's now SSDs, right? So the commodity hardware is SSDs, it's not, it's not, it's not hard disks anymore. Uh, uh, but you need to be efficient. That's to say, your software has to be efficient on this commodity infrastructure. And, and of course, with the cloud, you need to think in terms of elastic provisioning. What does that mean? It means that, to, from a customer's point of view, it means that he wants to be able to expand and contract his, his, uh, his uh, resource needs as, as his software requires it. From the cloud provider, what it means is that if a user isn't fully exploiting the software that he has, we, we should be able to take away some of his resources and put the money that he's spending on those resources into our pocket. So, so uh, 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 what, what uh, cloud vendors tend to do is they, is they sell on a particular box a little bit more capability than that box is able to deliver. And, 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 and for that, they can pocket Whatever the, whatever the difference is, so long as they meet their SLA and, and service level agreement. And, and, and um, that means that when a customer wants to use resources, they have to be there and available to them for the kind of, kind of uh, uh, performance, whatever, that he needs. But when he's not using it fully, you can take those resources and put them, give them to somebody else. And again, you can, you can pocket that money, that difference, uh, uh, as part of your, uh, as part of your pocket. So money talks. It doesn't matter if one is dollars, or euros, or pounds, or yens, or rupees, or, <coughs> or mimbies, or, you know, you, so money talks, money matters. And, and, and my emphasis in this talk is to tell you how money matters and why, it, why the traditional vendors are fine when it comes to thinking about it in terms of So traditional database systems are caching data streams. I don't know whether people have used that term or not before, but what I mean is they're, you know, they're, well, I have the next slide here, so caching data streams. And traditional database systems have good cost performance. They don't always have, they don't always have performance that's as good as the main memory databases, uh, but they have decent performance, and, and, and the costs between these systems uh, can vary enormously, and, and these systems have been tailored and worked on to, in fact, try to reduce reduce the cost to customers. You may say, well, uh, uh, traditionally, you know, vendors just sold the database, and, and it was up to the user to provide the money, so it didn't really matter. Uh, Microsoft used to uh, give you a package uh, SQL Server, ship it to you. I was going to say to Amazon, but, you know, <laughs> but they didn't, they, Amazon didn't exist back then. But they used to sh ship it to you through the mail, right? It was your system. That's your piece of software. However much your hardware infrastructure costs, well, that was your responsibility. But now with SQL Azure, you run your database, you run SQL Server in the cloud. So, so suddenly, how much resource a <coughs> SQL Server uses is a big factor in whether or not uh, how many bucks Microsoft can make. Uh, in, in Azure. Okay, so, so it becomes a very big deal. Um, okay, so these systems that we're talking about, these, these caching systems, have, have a lower performance than the recent main memory.
memory database system. But what I'm going to do is show you in a full uh, few charts why that's not a huge deal. And in fact, why, why in fact, um, it has better cost performance. <coughs> so I'm going to suggest a change in focus of, of the field from not exclusively on performance, but on cost performance. So database, caching database use, use a cache. Well, of course they do. That's why, that's why I gave them that name, right? So what's a cache? A cache is simply a way of keeping the data that you're actually using in main memory and letting the rest of it migrate out to or, or remain on secondary storage, right? So, so what does that mean? It means that, it means that you're not using your expensive storage medium to store data that you're not intensively working on. That data leaves the expensive medium and goes out to Secondary storage, usually now. Usually now it's and and that in the cloud, that memory which you don't use for one customer can be used for somebody else. It's like when you multiplex the processor. You know, when you multiplex the processor away after somebody gets their their time slot, you move it to somebody else, and they use it. Uh, and, and then when they're through, use it. As if somebody's idle for a while and they miss their slot, well, that's money again in the cloud vendor's pocket, right? So, so uh, the less resources you use, the better it is for you as a customer because the, the cloud vendor can, can charge you less, but the better it is for the cloud vendor because whatever difference it is between what they sell and what they, pay, what they charge you and, and, and what, you, what they get, uh, that goes into their pocket. And in a, data, uh, in a data caching system, the data lives permanently on secondary storage. Now notice, in the, in the database world, we make a lot of, of emphasis in transactional systems about durability. I haven't mentioned durability here yet. It happens that secondary storage tends to be durable, right? But, but the fact of the matter is that it's economics, too. Secondary storage costs less than main memory costs. So it's not just a matter of durability. Durability is important, but it's not just dur durability. It's also cost. And, and, and also, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some cost numbers. Uh, they, were, they have their limitations, but you'll see, you'll see where I'm going with this. So, so the, the result of, of, having, of having the data caching system is that you've got two forms of operation. You've got an operation on your data when the data is found in main memory, it's in the cache, right? and and that's very fast. That can be millions, millions of operations per second, right? And then you've got your secondary storage operations, and those operations are well. What happens when the data isn't in the cache? Well, you have to bring the data into the cache because we don't implement native operations on flash memory, right? You have to bring it in to to some random access memory so that you can operate on it. In our experience. This is after optimizing substantially for the I/O path. Uh, that the main memory operations, uh, 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 secondary storage operations, are about a factor of six more expensive to execute than 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 main memory operations. Do you have a question? Is that because of amortization? Because you stay in main memory for a certain period of time? Is that where you're getting that six x factor? Uh, that's forget forget about the the, the, the stuff. Think about secondary storage operations that the data is not in cache, I need to bring it in. Okay. That operation includes the cost of bringing it in. Okay, but does it also include the cost of once it's in, you're gonna reuse it a couple times? No. Okay. Okay, all right, thank you. If, if you reuse it subsequently, those become main memory operations. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Is this for SSDs or for disks? Hmm? Is this for SSDs or disks? Uh, the big uh, six is, is for which one? What storage? So we use SSDs. <coughs> Performance implications are not that different. Okay, this this is this is the this is the execute this is caused by the execution in the, in the processor of the I/O path. Okay, so so this is at least I'll, I'll come back to that later. But this is this is this is basically the fact that the execution path is a factor of six longer when you're when you're executing uh, the operation, which includes which includes having to go to disk. Doesn't, doesn't, we're not talking about costs here, we're talking simply about execution time. 
So, data capturing system, remove the fact of sex. I mean, that, that, that doesn't look like such a great idea, does it? And here's proof that it's not such a great idea. We, we ran our system. These are, these are the experimental points. And uh, I sort of drew these lines and sort of captured the general trend. And, and, and it's between, what is it, between, it's, it's 5.8 plus or minus 30%. Uh, uh, and and so, so what happens is as you get more and more secondary storage operations, performance approaches a factor of one, one sixth of what you started with, right? So, so, so suddenly you're, you know, you're really losing performance, you know? You're happy as a clam if you're up here, and you're not so happy if you're down here in the performance world, okay? So, so that looks, again, that looks like a really bad idea. So, so uh, why, why are we doing this? Right? And, and, the, and the answer is, uh, uh, costs matter in addition to performance. And that's, that's the message which I, I sort of gave to you last time I was here, which is now a year and a half ago, and you guys were not even born yet, but, but uh, uh, seems that way to me. Uh, uh, but costs do matter. And, and, uh, and so let's look at cost performance. Okay, uh, there are two costs. This is this is a this is this is a very simple story. There are two costs to operate on data. One cost is the storage cost. The interesting thing about the storage cost is you pay it all the time, whether or not you're working on the data or not. You're paying to keep that data <coughs> around, uh, and so. Interestingly enough, most of your data is usually cold. So you're paying the price even for this data which doesn't need it, right? Um, okay. The other cost is execution cost. That's you grab a processor and you execute execute some instructions on it, and then you give it up. So so how many how much how much the piece of the processor that you use in completing that execution? So these are both costs. These are costs in terms of the, the per byte memory cost. This is the per operation execution cost. Right? So it's, it's, I'm going to give you absolute numbers on, on the cost of storage and of, 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 of uh, processor costs, but I'll give you relevant numbers. I mean, I've got the someplace stored in the resources of my computer. This absolute numbers, but, but here's the interesting thing. In terms of storage costs, flash memory is about one-tenth the cost of DRAM. One-tenth. Which means that if you, if you keep things in main memory, you're going to pay a factor of 10 more than you're going to pay if it's on secondary storage. For the storage cost part. Now you end up, you're going to pay more in execution costs when things are on secondary storage. And in fact, the ratio here is about 12 to 1, right? So this is the cost of the main memory operation. It's how much process, this is how much processor time you're going to take in, in main memory. And then over here, it's a more complicated story. It's a, comp it's a story of, well, this is the cost to execute the operation once the data gets into main memory. So it's the same operation over here. But now you're going to have to deal with the cost of bringing it in. And, and this is the I.O. path. This is the, I, the, the processor I.O. path to bring it in. And this is the cost of buying an I.O. On, on the SSD. Okay? So, so how, do you, how do you get this part of the cost? It's a sort of interesting question, which, which we had rather contentious arguments about when, back when I was doing this analysis. But, but the fact of the matter is, is, that, is that modern SSDs are surprisingly good at having brought this cost down. It's even gone lower now because the Samsung has done, and I'm, I don't work for Samsung, so this is not an advertisement for them, but Samsung has done a terrific job with commodity disks in terms of bringing down the cost of um, I.O. assets. Well, how do they do that? Well, they do it by simply selling you the same SSD with the same storage capacity and having more I.O. operations atta attached to it. Hence, hence when you divide the, 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 the cost part of the, of the of 
getting the IO by a larger number, you get a smaller number as a result. So this, so this, so this number has come down. So, okay, so that's that's that comment. The new SSDs now support hundreds of thousands of IOPS. By way of comparison, hard disks ones where, which have huge capacities and have a cost which is in fact less than the cost of provided of SSDs, hard disks have on the order of 100, 100 IO accesses per second. And, and this is, so this is a factor of a thousand uh, in terms of the number of IOs that can be supported. All right. So, going to do is we're going to we're going to show how the costs change as your the frequency with which you operate on the data change. Okay, we're going to go from cold data to hot data, and we're going to talk about how those costs change. So this is a linear function. This is this is higher mathematics for me. I haven't done I haven't done linear algebra for a really long time, uh, and so this is a great insight, great opportunity for me to flex my algebra muscles. Um, so the cost is AX plus a, a plus BX. A, a is the storage cost. That's how much you have to pay to rent the storage per second. Okay. Now I haven't told you how much storage we're renting, but whatever storage we're renting, we're going to multiply the, the cost per byte per second by the amount of storage we, which we need. And then this is the cost per operation times the number of operations per second. So if you're comfortable with that as the cost equation, you, know, you can make this cost equation arbitrarily complex. You can say, well, what about the air conditioning cost? What about the land cost? What about, what about the cost of the building that house? We're not going to talk about any of that, right? This is, this is, this is dumbed down so that I can understand it and try to explain it to you. Right? But this is the equation. Cost equals storage cost plus whatever the cost per operation is times the operations per second. And that's a linear equation. So you, wouldn't be, you will not be surprised to see that it produces a linear function. Okay, so there's the storage cost, cost per byte times the size of the data. Uh, and to remind you that DRAM is approximately a factor of 10, more expensive than, than, than uh, flash. And at zero operations per second, which is when your data is cold, storage cost is the only cost. It's the only cost. So for that reason, when I, when I show you the, the, the graph, you're going to see that the y-intercept of this, of this linear equation is the storage cost. The execution cost is simply cost per operation times operation per second. When the data is really hot, well, I have this column here, then most of the costs end up being execution costs. Right? And, 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 it's, and there, when you have a very high performance system, that you can actually operate at a lower cost point than with these, with the, uh, by having everything in main memory. But, but the interesting fact of most, of most pieces of collections of data that you have is that most of the data, most of the time, is cold. It only becomes intermittently hot. And surely, when it's hot, you want it in main memory so that you can get actually lower costs that way. But when it's colder, you, by gosh, you want it on, on secondary storage, so it's not consuming the expensive resources. And, and so that's the stuff. So here's the, here's the equation. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is going to be. Um, so this is a derivative. I'm just going to state the result of this. This is, this is I'm going to, from this perspective, I'm going to derive Gray's five minutes. Gray's five minute rule is when these costs, when the secondary storage operation equals, uh, cost equals the main memory cost. As I say, when the data is of sufficient heat, when you're operating on it sufficiently, that's the crossover point where you want to, where, where, where uh, Gray's five minute rule comes into, into effect. And that's where you want to change from having the, the, the stuff on, on uh, secondary storage to bringing it in and keeping it in. 
uh, from range five minute rule, now a one minute rule. Why is it a one minute rule now? What's happened? Uh, what's happened is mostly that SSDs can execute huge, a factor of a thousand more IOs, so much more cheaply. The IO is much more cheap than, than, than it was with a hobby stick. And so here's the fundamental Lomet equation. It's, it's like the theory of relativity, except that it's simpler. It came from me, and it's only a linear equation. But aside from that, um, so here's the main memory operation. It has this high cost because it's got, got to pay for the storage cost. And then it runs very slowly because it's rather, rather uh, uh, efficient at executing operations. Okay? And here's the secondary storage operation. It starts at a factor of 10 less than the cost of keeping things in main memory. But it grows, goes faster, grows faster. And where they, where they cross is raise five minute rule, now, now, now raise one minute rule. And the, the interesting thing about a caching system, here's the thing where it, I mean, where it gets its advantage is it can change to, to over here when the data is cold, executing the, the secondary storage operations, and when the data is hot, executing the main memory operations. All right. All right. So what about, what, so, so that's very nice for caching systems. That describes how caching systems work and how well they can do. What about other, other kinds of systems? Um, just a little bit of background. Um, there were people who were doing bake-offs between my data caching system and their main memory system. And um, I got tired of having us lose the battle for who has the very best uh, performance. So when you don't like the results of that game, you try to change the game. So this is my this is my game changer. Okay. So <laughs> memory, memory systems perform better. Uh, indeed, they perform better <coughs> than caching database systems, even when all the data is cached. And why is that? Well, they, they when you're in when you're in main memory, you have a lot more opportunities for optimization. You have you can have direct pointers to data. You can, you can have uh, special arrangements uh, uh, which which keep you know you move data around doesn't have to doesn't you don't have to worry about putting it back on the secondary storage because you're not putting it back on the secondary storage. There's some other issues involved. On there's a lot of log processing, and, and some of these systems don't capture all of those costs because they get sort of done in the background by somebody else. But they still have to be paid for in some way. At any rate, um, so what I'm going to do is compare mastery, which is one of the very notable and very successful and very good uh, uh, main memory key value stores, not database systems, to our Deuteronomy high performance and data caching key value stores. Okay? And, and so mass tree has higher performance than, than the BW tree. It's about 2.6 times the performance of, of, the, of the BW tree. You say, oh my gosh. What a disaster for the BW tree. Ah, but in terms of storage cost, and this is only a point experiment, so, so you, can, you can solve it with your own, with your own uh, uh, assessment, but it uses 2.3, mastery uses 2.3 times as much main memory to execute as does uh, the Deuteronomy BW tree. Right, so what does that do? Well, so you shouldn't be surprised. It yields a curve where, so here's, a, here's our old curve where this is the main memory operation and this is the, the storage operation, which I showed you before. I've, I've, I've changed the axis a little bit so that I could fit everything on, on, on the same scale. And here, and here is, and here is mastery. Mastery uses over twice as much memory as, as does the BW tree. But it has a lower cost, right? Because it, because it uh, execution cost because it performs higher, higher performance. So that leads to a place where this is a crossover point. That crossover point is, a, is around three seconds to a four k page. Okay. So if your page is 
this is uh, just some pages simply to give you a, a sense of, a sense of, 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 of what, the, what the heat of the data is. But um, uh, this, is where, this is where they cross. And you can see that from here, which is where, where, uh, where uh, the main memory operation and the, and the secondary storage operation cross over to here, is a, a fairly significant interval in which, in which the BW3 is, continues to be uh, less costly to, act, to operate, even though they're both in main memory, less costly to operate than, than, than the MASH3. And once you get over here, then in fact, then in fact the MASH3 is lower cost. So when the performance, your performance needs get really, really extreme, then you want to use the MASH3. Unfortunately, it's not easy to switch between, between uh, Deuteronomy and the mash tree, right? You sort of pays you money and it takes you a choice. Here we have a choice because because here here when the, when the data gets sufficiently cold, we we can actually take it out of uh, out of uh, out of the BW3 main memory and stick it on the secondary storage. So so uh, so what's the story here? So Deuteronomy has better cost performance all the way over to the time when you're executing three million operations per second on 4K which is uh, very extreme performance. And, and the match tree does better look at here. Now there are, there, are, there are applications where this is important, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to tell you that it's not. But what I will say is most of the applications are over here. Okay? Most of the applications are over here. And this is the heart of the database world. And, and, and for this range, uh, you've pretty much got most users, most of the time, happy with the cost of the thing. <coughs> Question. Yeah. Is that most of the markets are on the left? Mm -hmm. how, how do you support this argument? And from, from what source do you make that conclusion? So, so I can give you some indirect. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Name your systems have not seen much market penetration. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Way not this is this is not something which you need for for uh, interactive response time. Okay. It's, it's, you have to the data. I'm going to tell you the data is really hot when it's way over here. Most systems are no have data which is nowhere near as hot as that. And then and then the other part of it is even if you have data which sometimes is that hot, you often have data which is cold. Think about think about Amazon and. You know, or think about the airline industry. You know, the data gets a little bit hot uh, when when the plane is, you know, when the when when the, the ticketing and plane, you know, uh, gets somewhere close to the time of takeoff, right? But you know, months before that, that 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 data is still in the system, but it, it's really got no no heat at all to it, right? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, so, so the joke is, uh, I'll, I'll say that joke. So, so I, yeah, yeah. I would like to clarify one other assumption. Mm -hmm. for, Deuteron for the Deuteronomy, bench Deuteronomy benchmarks you have here, are you assuming that this is some batch processing at night where you hit every record of the, of the uh, database, or are you assuming that it's just a couple of words out of every page is being touched? So, th so in some respects, it doesn't really matter how many words uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. But, okay. but, but at this level of analysis, uh, when we're dealing with pages, uh -huh. it doesn't matter how much you're paying for the page, even if you're only touching a few, a few, a few uh, parts. Of small Correct. Parts, right? that's, well, that's so, so this doesn't have anything to do with that. Right? But, but what I'm trying to get at is where that 6x throughput comes, because I thought the SSDs had like sometimes a 5,000 cycle write. Uh, it takes 5,000 cycles to write to the page. Yeah, but you're not, that, that's latency. Okay. That's latency, and you're not, and you, you, I've already factored that into the cost. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, and that's the, that's the, that's the cost of this curve here. Okay. Because, okay. So since, because we're talking about costs, um, that doesn't matter. Yeah. So, 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 so it matters, but when you're comparing this line with this line, there's no, there's no secondary storage involved. Okay. This is, right. this is, this is main memory Deuteronomy. Okay. This is this is main memory. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, master. Okay. 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 No, I've already made that comment. You can't you can't 
switch. I mean, it would be nice if you could, but you can't switch between uh, Deuteronomy and, and mastery uh, easily. Okay. So now I want to talk about another aspect, and this is this is a, the Facebook problem. And the Facebook. This was a, based on a, a uh, an article of, uh, that was published a couple of years ago by Facebook at Cider, which talked about the problem that they were facing at Facebook. They've got this huge volume of data. It's almost all cold, right? Because, you know, even if you think about, well, an active user, blah, 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 you know, you're talking about human time, right? You're talking about human interaction time. You know, um, remember that, that, that you know, um, even with the Deuteronomy stuff, the operation has to be, you know, once, at least once a minute before you, before you pay to even put things permanently in cash. So, 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 uh, uh, and most of the time, of course, you're not, you're not actually online, so you're not actually using the machine that often. There's long periods of time when the data is just sitting there and not being used. Okay. It's almost all cold. And Facebook was buying processors, but not because they needed the processing power. They needed to be able to attach more to SSDs. And, and, uh, uh, I can't tell you the exact detailed rationale what involved in this. There was a paper, it's a cited paper, I think it was in cited 2017. I remember um, reading that paper. And, and uh, so, so uh, uh, they were buying additional systems so that they could attach additional, additional SSDs. And the solution that they came up with was to use data compression, you need less infrastructure. Not in fact, you're not in fact um, um, don't need as many. Right? So, but here's the problem, of course: is, uh, is data compression costs you execution cycles when you're when you're uh, executing operations against compressed data, and and uh, so all this comes at increased execution costs. So, so what's the story here? So here's here this is let me just this is strictly hypothetical. This is based on zero, zero scale. There's no scale on this. So, so, so but here's, here's our old Deuteronomy main memory operation. Here's the secondary storage operation. Here's where they get. So what you, what's going on here? Well, you're taking, you're taking the storage cost, which used to be like this, and you're reducing it down further because you're compressing data. And so, uh, so you're saving storage costs over here where there's no operations going on. But you're in fact <coughs> Raising the cost of execution. Right? So, so in fact, uh, so in fact, by the time you get over to here, it doesn't look like uh, operating on compressed data off of off of uh, SSDs is such a great idea. And of course, they cache, so it's a caching system, so they don't don't actually pay this cost. And then you have this little region over here where it looks like you have an advantage, but you got most of most of the most of the uh, most of the interesting part of the graph is elsewhere. So why is this such a big deal? Well, first of all, if I really wanted to emphasize why it's a big deal, I would have made this a logarithmic scale, right? Uh, I didn't because I, I like the idea of keeping the analysis simple and show, continuing to show linear straight lines as a linear function, right? But, but, uh, but the fact of the matter is that um, no, okay. <coughs> most of your data is out here. Okay, so, so and, and only a small part of the data is hot, right? So, and I've put 80-20 there, but the fact of the matter is that 80-20 is being generous. It's probably more like 95 to 5, right? Um, but I can tell you, with Facebook, here's the, here's the joke, even Mohan can't keep Facebook data hot, right? So, so those of you who, who uh, have Mohan as one of your friends on Facebook knows that he's, he posts more information to Facebook than anybody I ever knew, right? But even he can't keep Facebook data hot, right? Most of it's cold. And in fact, when it's cold, you, you, you win big over here, because you win by a factor of three or so over, over simply storing it in an uncompressed mode on the SSD. And that's important. Right? Now, it turns out the Facebook problem is that they also were buying processors so that they could, they could, so that they could connect the disks to, 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 um, to the system. But, uh, so they were even saving even more. But this is important. 
they're saving money here well, by, by cutting the, the storage costs even while increasing execution costs. Now, I've, I've just added this as an extra box. What about non-volatile memory, which is the new technology? How does that fit into the picture? Well, here's our old you know, Deuteronomy numbers where this is the main memory operation, this is the secondary storage operation where the crossover. And what does is, what is non-volatile memory look like? Well, um, that's getting a great five minute roll. So if you just use non-volatile memory as part of an SSD, it looks like a really bad idea. And I'm not gonna qualify that. It looks like a bad idea. Intel is selling an Octane drive, which has some sort of phase change memory in it. But I think that's a bad idea, because you're paying a lot more, and you still have to have all the execution costs of, of executing it uh, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the execution path, and you're not getting that much cheaper uh, IL ops from it. So, so it doesn't look like a great idea. However, as a memory extension idea, it looks pretty interesting. What does that say? Well, you're still paying the storage cost, but now you, you compare it with the main memory cost, and it's, and it's a factor of three less, and you don't have to execute the I.O. path to bring the data into main memory. I'm assuming now that you're going to not operate on the data directly on, uh, on the non-volatile store, uh, but you're going to load it into, into, uh, into main memory to execute on it. This goes up faster than the main memory operation does, but but it goes up a, a lot slower than the secondary storage operation does. And so it looks like this is pretty promising as a potential technology once, once it becomes more widely available. So, so I think that there's a, a role for non-volatile memory, but I don't think it's as a replacement for flash. I think flash is going to be around for quite a while. Uh, so what that means, of course, is that You have a deeper memory hierarchy. The problem with a deeper memory hierarchy is always just adding a little bit more system complexity to things. Uh, but I don't think it's enormous. I don't think I, don't, I, don't, I think that I think that it's pretty easy to get your head around this. Uh, when you first bring it in, you bring it in, you may store it in 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 in, in, uh, in the hall of memory, and then you bring it in as you execute on it. So so I don't think it's I don't think it's a terrible thing. So I want to end with, well, how do you make data, data, data uh, uh, high performance data caching systems? What's the, what's the secret sauce? Uh, all right, so, I have a broken slide. All right, so one way to reduce the cost of processing data is to make the execution cost uh, lower. That's very simple. You lower the execution cost by making your operations consume fewer fewer instructions. Right? And, and it's it's not a matter of, of the latency of the operation. If you devote two cores to executing an operation, you'd be doubling the cost of using a single core. So it's it's a single core performance. If you make single core performance twice as fast, you'll cut that cost in half. It's the execution cost. You can reduce the number of IOs. Well, you can say, well, how, how do I do that, right? Well, so, so well, uh, using log structuring is one of the ways you do that. What, what, is, what does log structuring do? It says, okay, instead of, instead of doing a write every time a block gets changed, I will accumulate the blocks into a large buffer, and I'll do one IO for the large buffer, right? You've just reduced rather dramatically the cost of handling the writes. If you do blind writes, instead of always getting, bringing data in so you can update in place, you sort of accumulate the, the blind writes, <coughs> excuse me, in memory, which the LSM tree does, which Deuteronomy does, uh, you save a lot because you're, you're not doing I.O. <coughs> whenever traditional systems used to do I.O. So that's a good idea. Okay, third way to do it is say, well, what about, suppose I could reduce the cost of moving data between SSD and main memory. So, so 
Now I'm not talking about avoiding moving it, I'm talking about how do you reduce the cost. Okay, well, one of the things we tried was user level IO. The cost came down by about 30%. So that's already reflected in the numbers you're seeing here. Um, uh, um, Samsung is doing a great job of lowering the cost of IOPS, so that's another way to reduce the cost. And, and then we had a, uh, uh, an inter internship last summer, sort of ongoing since it wasn't quite completed, which, which is attacking the problem of, 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 of modifying an SSD's controller so that it's more efficient at handling at handling these box structured runs. So. And then finally, you can reduce the cost of secondary storage. And actually, compression is exactly what you do. That's exactly what you do when you compress data. Okay. Uh, and you can use flash instead of instead of NV RAM instead of RAM. Uh, if your data is cold enough, you can use disk. If your data is even colder, you can use tape. If your data is really super cold, you can use DNA, right? You know, um, depends on how cold your data is and what sort of latency you require in getting to it. Now, with Facebook's problem is they wanted low latency, but also low cost. And so their, their solution was to, was to compress data on SSDs. Oh, okay, now some caveats. All the numbers are approximate. Right? Do not believe the number. <laughs> These were numbers which are which were pulled out of, out of sources on the web, one point in time, unreliable sources, my scratching my head. Uh, so, so the numbers are, are approximate. Right. Cost of web prices, but I but I think that the general thrust of the of the analysis is, is is gives you a picture which is which is interesting and shows you why using data caching systems <coughs> is a good idea. And, and restricting yourself to main memory systems only if, only in some very strange cases will that make sense. So I'm going to show you one case. Best best cost performance is great, but it's not always the best. Low costs are only one thing. What you want to do is maximize the value you get from the data minus the cost. Right? So, so if if the value that you get for the for for the data is incredibly high, if the latency is incredibly low, then maybe you want to use a main memory system. As a case in point is some of these stock trading systems where basically it's a race between the systems as to who gets to, the, the, to trade the stuff first, and blah, blah, blah. Um, these are, that's not my favorite application. I hate those guys. But, but, but the fact of the matter is that that's, that's where some of this high, uh, high performance uh, main memory systems are being pulled in. Yeah, value might be depends on, on latency, blah, blah, blah. I already said that. But most of the time, interactive system latency is adequate. Anything less than a millisecond per operation should be fine. And uh, as examples, online shopping. There's many more applications in this part than there is in this. And, and uh, which is the reason why Microsoft is more concerned about Amazon's Aurora than it is about, than it is about the Mac tree, as an example. So two costs, storage costs, which are always present. That's, that's the, the critical thing. And execution costs, which only occur when you execute operations. And the reason why you can separate these out is cold storage, um, uh, cold data, um, uh, uh, storage costs dominate, hot data, um, execution costs dominate. Data caching systems win because they can change between these So we should be focusing on, on, on data caching and not on main memory. And it's talked to you by brought to you by the BW3 in production. Just to give you a little plug for my stuff. Uh, SQL Service Hackathon, which is a main memory system, uses our BW3, which wasn't designed.
for many memory operation, although it works very well in memory And, and uh, uh, in Azure Document DB, now called Cosmos uh, DB. Uh, it's the indexing engine for the, for the documents. It allows them to support uh, uh, immediate uh, indexing of documents as they enter the system because you don't have to, we use blind writes, you don't have to, we don't have to, to bring in pages to update the pages in place. The blind writes are accumulated in memory. And then Bing Object Store also used us as References and questions. Thank you. Yeah. Have you run your linear models using uh, assuming HP ever builds its memristor system? It's a uh, memristor main memory. They they just they said they wanted to just have this ungodly amount of main memory in memristors. And uh, with the execution, it's much cheaper, but the execution costs are um, are a little higher. So, so that was that was my effort to get at that. I talked yeah. about it in terms of, of, of NBM. Yeah, but 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 but, uh, but what my question is is with the actual numbers for memristors, have you ever plugged those numbers in? Because I'm wondering if it would lower the cost so much that it would start to look attractive. So versus NBM. So I don't. So. This is all, this is just all scribbled on a chart, right? Okay. <laughs> this is, <laughs> there's, there's no data in back of this. It's a hypothetical, right? Okay. But, but uh, whether, it's, whether it's phase change or memristor, um, the idea here is that it's gotta be, it's gotta be more expensive than flash, but less expensive than DRAM. And then, and then the idea here is if you use it, if you use it as an SSD, that looks like a bad idea. If you use it as a memory extension, it looks interesting. What, what if it's cheaper than Flash? I thought the memoristor stuff was super cheap. Well, if it's super cheap, then HP is doing a really bad I, job I in competing with some. <laughs> so, so I don't know, right? You know, I was, I will now tell you how old I was, very indirectly. Um, I was around when there was a transition from core memory to semiconductor memory. Right. And for five straight years, People were talking about about uh, uh, semiconductor memory replacing core memory, and 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 the core people laughed, right? And then five years later, finally the crossover point arrived, and suddenly there was a phase <coughs> change in the, in the industry, and everybody went to semiconductor memory. Until it appears and it's sold, and you can tell, and you go out and buy it and compare, it, you don't know, right? So so um, it's possible. Um, uh, uh, but I don't know. If, if, it, if, it, if, it, if it sells at less than flash prices, then flash will lose, right? Um, but the, but it's, it's more expensive in terms of latency, though, I think. So I don't know. Okay. Don't, don't know. Okay. Um, flash latency is, 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 a, is, is, a, is a complicated story. Yeah. Too. I mean, um, we're in our project, we're trying to do something modifying the storage control. That's one of the projects we're working on. One of the things that Chen will, will be helping us with, and 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 it's tricky to 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 get low latency and and all the other properties you want, and low costs and and you know and log structuring uh, basically trades uh, uh, latency for throughput because it accumulates batches. That's in the in the databasey type of system. That's usually a good trade-off, so long as the latency doesn't stretch out forever, because it's not on the, the execution path, latency path of any operation. Right? It's sort of all done in the background. Reads are a different problem, right? Reads you really worry about latency a lot more. Uh, so, so, so I don't know, right? You, you know, um, the technology will evolve. You'll see the winner. The market will determine the right. winner, but the market will determine the winner based on a curve like this, right? As opposed yeah. to simply trying to figure out what the, what the top performance is. Yeah. So I saw you have this uh, in-memory PW tree mm -hmm. inside the uh, hackathon. Yeah. So why can't you apply your arguments to in-memory data, uh, data structures? Or so did, you call, I compared it with mass tree. Yeah, but you, the whole argument is, uh, is saying, if I understand it correctly, that the in-memory databases 
in our case, not that it's not that promising. I told you it was a zero billion dollar yeah, business. But, but you have you have a you have a in memory because PWP. Yes, that's right. Yes. So how come that argument does not apply to the index structure? Why could you why do you want to have in memory data structure, but you don't want to have in memory database? So so SQL sells an in memory database. It's for that small part of the market which has needs for really high requirements. In fact, I can tell you who their biggest customer was. It's this, it's this uh, European uh, betting site. I can't remember <laughs> what, the what, what the name of it is, but it's a betting site. Uh, and they, 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 wanted, they, uh, uh, they, they needed the higher performance, and so they were willing to pay what it took. All right, I think we should end here, because it looks like, because we're running late, people are starting to accumulate outside. They must have the room, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, they were sort of staring in, going, <laughs> uh, so thank you. But, but you intimidated yeah. them <laughs> by staring back. No, I didn't. <laughs>